Welcome everyone. So, in our first video here in Cuenca, we mentioned that the history here in Cuenca goes way, way back, thousands of years, far, far further back than just Spanish colonial history. And today, we're going to see a little bit of that history from thousands of years ago at the uh, ruins of Pumapongo. So come along. Before we do that, I just want to say real quick thank you very much for watching the video. Click the like button and the subscribe button and leave a comment down below. It's free, it's easy, and it will help the channel grow and help this content reach other YouTube viewers. Alright, back to the video. So here we are out on the street. A typical cloudy morning in Cuenca. Uh, the sun hasn't been out too much the last few days and in the afternoons been like pouring rain so I wanted to get out in the morning and go see Puma Pongo. So what exactly is Puma Pongo? Well it's uh, it's like a ruins of an old very very old um, archaeological it's an old archaeological site. The ruins of a very very old structure or complex of structures. I'm not quite sure. Did a little research into it. Um, not a ton because they have a museum there and I figure we can learn a lot more from the museum but basically it's the ruins of like an old set of structures from the Cañari civilization and the Cañari they were here um, before the Inca and the Inca of course were here before the Spanish and uh, actually in Ecuador it's a little more complicated than that because the Cañari were actually here at the same time as the Inca sort of like um, they were they were subject to the Inca because the Inca came in and conquered but uh, the Cañari they still existed here and they were sort of well at least when the Spanish showed up and started a war with the Inca the Cañari joined the Spanish side and uh, when you hear about stories about how some you know a few hundred conquistadors were able to overthrow an army of like 10 20,000 Inca soldiers it's because they had uh, other tribal and ethnic groups on their side like the Cañari here in Ecuador so when when the Spanish overthrew the Inca it was with the help of like 10,000 Cañari soldiers um, helping them helping them fight so it's very important to remember that but the Cañari uh, they had this site here at Puma Pongo when the Inca came in and conquered they took over the site and they used it and then when the Spanish came in and conquered, I'm not sure exactly what happened after that. But ultimately now, in present time, it is a uh, sort of like a preserved ruin that's also kind of like a garden or a park that you can walk through, see the ruins. And there's a museum right there too, so we're going to check all that out. Okay, so we're coming up on the museum now. It's right here. This big, big uh, concrete brutalist building on the right here. and. Uh, if you've watched any of my previous videos, especially, especially my video about Plaza de Armas in uh, Santiago, Chile, you'll know that I am not really a fan of brutalist architecture. I think it's kind of ugly. Um, but this building, I don't know. It looks pretty cool. I think the thing that I don't like about brutalist architecture is I don't like brutalist architecture when it's for a building that's just like any normal building, you know, like an apartment building. And I really don't like it when it's mixed in with, uh, you know, like neo-colonial, real fancy, beautiful architecture. But when it's like a big freestanding thing like this and it ends up looking like a giant, I don't know, fort or something. Or some shit out of like Judge Dredd. I don't know. I think that's pretty cool. So, I approve. Anyway, museum's right here next to the Banco Central de Ecuador. I think these buildings are actually attached. This is all just one building, Central Bank and the museum. But anyway, that's where we're going, the museum. And I think we should go to the museum first because like I said, I did a little bit of research about Puma Pongo, but not really enough to know, well, definitely not enough to make a whole video without going into this museum and figuring out exactly what the hell we're looking at. So let's go there first. The Museo Puma Pongo. Puma Pongo, and it uh, turns out the buildings are not attached. There's the bank building over there. And in between, it's actually a theater. 
Teatro Pumapungo, where they have uh, performances of some sort, I guess. There we go. And uh, I don't think we're going to be the only ones here, because uh, this museum is, I think, pretty popular. Well, let's go in and see what's going on. Okay, so we're in the museum. And uh, it turns out it's more than just an archaeological museum. Downstairs on the bottom level, oh, also it's free to get in, FYI. Um, downstairs on the bottom level, there's like an art museum. This exhibit here, Arte de Identidad, Art of Identity. Wrong. Bad Spanish translation. This is not Arte de Identidad, which means, of course, art of identity. It's Arte e Identidad, which means art and identity. Usually I let these slide, but uh, I don't know. I felt, I felt a certain way about this, and I wanted to correct myself. A uh, collection of uh, Alice Trepp. I don't know. It's a kind of cool modern art down here. And upstairs is like archaeological stuff, I think. And then there's an exit over, looks like right over there, where those people are leaving, that goes out to the park where the ruins are. So let's check this out down here real quick, because I'm, I'm interested to see this. I didn't know this stuff was here. But I'd be more interested to see uh, the archaeological stuff, since that's why we came here. But I still want to see all this stuff. <laughs> when I walked into this hall, I thought this was another museum patron out of the corner of my eye, and he was just standing here, like, looking at the exhibits. Turns out it's not. Turns out it's this guy, Nelson Roman, who I imagine is an artist, looks like. So maybe this is, like, oh, I wonder if this is, like, an homage to Ecuadorian artists. Possibly. Because, yeah... Here, like, there's these, you know, sculptures down here of the people. Strikingly lifelike sculptures. And then pictures of them up here with their biographies. Looks like Gloria Pavon Julios, Magdalena Pavon Julios, y Rosa Pavon Julios. Vocal artists, singers. More people over here. Elena Torres, actress and theater instructor. Juana Guarderas, actress and cultural gestora. I don't know that word, gestora. Somebody help me out. And Kuti Ormaza. There they are. I was not prepared for this. I don't know who any of these people are. And I can't take the time to read all of that in Spanish. I'm sorry. My Spanish is not good enough. But you'll know if you've watched any of my other videos. And here... Segundo Teororo Mendez de Jesus. Bailador de Bomba. Dancer. This gentleman, Don Guillermo Ayovi, Papa Roncon, Gestor Cultural y Musico. Gestor. That's the same as Gestora, except masculine. I don't know that word. Someone help me out. Gestor? Gestora? What does that mean? Okay, this, this is quite interesting, but this is not what we came here to see. So, I think it's time to go upstairs and see... The, uh, the archaeological stuff, which I think is upstairs. Let's go check. Ethnographia, ethnography. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it looks like they have photos here. Archivo fotografico of, I'm guessing, Kanyari people. Looks like art and like dance ceremonies, traditional 
basket weaving and houses. I don't know if this is Cagnari. There's no sign. So for now, we're going to say it is. And then if I'm wrong, which I probably am, someone will very politely um, correct me in the comments. That's really cool. Look at that. I've seen people doing basket weaving like this out on the streets and then selling the baskets like street vendors doing it. But this is cool. This is much more intricate. A little like animal toy. Very cool. Let's keep looking. It was at this point that I was told by a security guard that I wasn't actually allowed to film in here, but I was allowed to take pictures. So we took pictures through the rest of this exhibit up here, which actually was not what I was expecting. I was expecting that it was going to be an exhibit about the Cagnari and about the ruins of Puopongo specifically, um, explaining the history and things like that. But really what it was was a much wider uh, exhibit about the ethnography of different um, ethnic groups, indigenous ethnic groups that are still living in uh, Ecuador today in different regions. So each one of the rooms that we go through has like a different sort of mini exhibit explaining about a specific ethnic group and uh, where, you know, what region of Ecuador they're from. Like the, uh, the little model of a canoe here and the picture of the people in the canoe for the uh, Chachi Cayapas. And these are people from the north in Esmeraldas province. They live in the jungle and travel uh, along the riverways and use the canoes to navigate the riverways. Also in Esmeraldas, on the eastern side, the, uh, a group of Af Afro-Equatorianos. They're uh, descendants of African slaves who were brought here in, made in the 1600s and 1700s. And uh, there's a large concentration of their descendants in the eastern side of, um, of the Esmeraldas province in the northern part of Ecuador along the border with Colombia. Just south of there in the Imbabura province, there's uh, artifacts here from three different peoples, the Octalvos, Atabuelas, and Caranquis. And they're people that have lived in this area and who were largely converted to Catholicism. And you can see that in the influence, that influence in the, uh, the artifacts here. And of course, the ethnic groups in, well, all across Latin America, but especially here in Ecuador, is very, very complex because there was a lot of mixing between the Spanish and indigenous populations for a long time. So the majority of people in Ecuador are actually mestizo, so they're mixed white and, and indigenous. And some ethnic groups are not, the, they're not very, um, like, I don't know how to say it, they're not as distinct um, because of all of the, the many centuries of mixing. Whereas others, um, like for example, the Tachilas uh, Colorados and um, in like the Pinchicha province, which is the, where Quito, the capital is, um, they, they maintained a lot of their, uh, their culture and their traditions um, with not a lot of uh, influence from Spanish uh, religion and culture. Whereas other, other groups, you see a lot of uh, influence from Catholic religion, from Spanish culture, and you, get, you end up today with this sort of mixed culture. Saw masks here, traditional and ceremonial masks from uh, indigenous people in Cotopaxi region, the Zumbahuas, Tiguas, Huangajes, and Maretas. Also saw traditional clothing from the Salsacas in the Tunguragua province. That's near Ambato. Ambato is pretty much right in the dead center of the country, um, up high in the Andes Mountains. Near Ambato is Rio Bamba which is um, uh, a city just south of Mbato, up in the, in the mountains as well, near uh, Mount Chimborazo, which is actually like the tallest mountain in all of Ecuador. And we saw some artifacts and clothing from, uh, from the people in that area. 
multiple groups, the Guanos, Cachas, and Guamotes. It was interesting to see those things uh, because Riobamba and uh, Ambato were very close to each other. I mean, you could get from one city to the other by like, in you know, like 45 minutes by bus. Um, but the, the ethnicities and ethnic groups in different areas that are s so close together are, are still very quite, quite different and distinct. I thought these were really cool. These were examples that they showed of the Chimbos people in the Bolivar um, like province. And basically there's a city in, in the province um, called Guaranda and they have like a big carnival celebration every year. It's a big deal. And uh, this is something that like you might see someone wearing in like a parade or one of the festivals in the carnival celebra celebration. And then of course there were the Cañaris, which we've uh, I've talked about briefly, you know, the the um, ruins that we're, that we're going to see really in Pumapongo were, were Cañari ruins. But the Cañari people still um, exist as an ethnic group in Cañar province, which is just north of, uh, of Cuenca, where, where Cuenca province is. And uh, here's, you know, they showed uh, some like traditional uh, garb from the Kanyari people. And then of course, from right here in Azue province, which is where Cuenca is, uh, they showed off, uh, tra the, this showed traditional uh, clothing, but also like some ceramics and pottery. I thought it was really interesting, especially to be in this province, like in Cuenca, um, in Azue province and see this right here in this museum, very cool. And then in Loja province, which is south of uh, Cuenca, in the uh, eastern side, the group uh, called Saraga Saraguros, they showed off some, uh, some uh, traditional garb, traditional clothing. Now, it was interesting, some of these uh, little small exhibits had a lot, a lot of stuff, and some of them only had, you know, like just one maybe set of clothing. I don't know if that was because they uh, didn't, you know, the museum wasn't able to um, acquire enough for the for the section or they just had like a, a lot for another section I'm not sure exactly why but it seemed to be that it was a little bit uneven uh, between the different uh, sections in this ethnography this last section here was really interesting it was a much larger section uh, sort of like off to the side you had to go into it it was very dark inside which was kind of cool and spooky um, but they were talking about the shuar which are people that live like uh, pretty deep in the jungles in Ecuador. So Ecuador, if you don't know, is pretty much separated into three different uh, biomes. Basically, there's the coastal area where, like, the cities of Guayaquil, uh, the city of Guayaquil is, and like Manta and those cities. And then there's the mountains that run north south, the Andes Mountains through the uh, through the country. So then, like, there's all the cities in there: Cuenca and Riobamba. Um, Ambato and Quito, they're all up very, very high up in the mountains. And then to the east of there, the mountains sort of like, it slopes back down to lower elevation, but that's in the Amazon rainforest. And a lot of the people that still live, the uh, indigenous people that still live in the Amazon rainforest, they were much more isolated. So their culture is much more like well-preserved. They have a lot of pictures of the people um, from what looked like, uh, I don't know, a little while ago, it definitely did, they definitely didn't look like they were from like, um, like the current day. This was maybe probably from a few decades ago. And they had a section in here talking about like uh, raids that the Shuar would carry out against um, like other tribes nearby, and um, if they would kill one of the other tribes, they would cut his head off and shrink it. And they had an actual shrunken head in here and they sort of explained the whole ritual of the shrunken head and why it was significant. It was kind of spooky but uh, uh, also just very very interesting. But after seeing all of that we, uh, we went back down to the door where I was told we could go out uh, to see um, you know to see the actual ruins and uh, this is where something kind of went wrong. We did see a map here there's a map here of the entire park, including the museum, the ruins, the theater, and a little key for everything. So it looks like there's multiple sites of ruins. This is the museum I think that we were in, right? Three? No. One. This is the museum. So there's ruins here, back here, on the other side. And I think we can walk around and see these things, so let's do that. But even though we saw a map, well, it didn't really help us that much. 
And that's not really the map's fault. Now begins one of the stupidest things that I've done in my entire time filming for this channel. Look at that face. Look at that stupid face. Anyway, enjoy. Okay, so, uh, I went outside the exit where they said, or I thought that the woman said, to go to see the ruins, and it was like gated off and closed. Then I went inside and I asked if I needed a guide to like go in and see the ruins. And the security guard I asked just said, no I, no I, which means not, there's nothing here, there's nothing here. And I think he may have misunderstood me, like, I think he may have thought, like I was asking, can I get a guide here to guide me through the ruins and they're not there? So, I don't know exactly if they're closed off. I'm walking past the park right here, okay? Because I said the ruins are all attached to like a park and a botanical garden that you can walk through. And I think, when I was walking past before, I saw some people up by the ruins. They were, uh, they were part of a group. I could tell because they were all wearing like the same clothes. It was like uh, kids from a school or something like that. So I can't tell still if you can access the ruins without a guide or if you just have to go like through this part of the park to get to them. We were able to see those ones that were right next to the museum through the window in the exhibit. And uh, oh, see here, look. So here's another group, right? Like they're all wearing the same clothes. So they're like with a tour group, right? Probably like from a school or something. But I don't know if you need a guide specifically to guide you through this park or if I can just get in uh, somewhere around here and walk around. I don't know, these, these gates are all closed. And I don't know how they got in here exactly. But look, you can see the ruins from here. I'll show you. Still gonna try and get in this park. I'm gonna try and get in here and see if we can walk around and see uh, see what we can see. I'm not, I don't know, I'm not super confident because all I can see are, are people like that are clearly you know like from a school, right? And like on a tour group. I don't see a lot of like just individual people walking around in there, other than like some workers who are doing like some landscaping. So. Let's see if we can get in. And if we can't get in today, then I will try and figure out if there's a way for me to get in at some point in the future. One thing you can see, even from outside the park here, is it's right next to the river. Rio Tomebamba. Right down there. So like I said in some previous videos, Cuenca is a very important place and there have been settlements here for thousands of years because of the rivers. It's a flat plain in the mountains, tons of rivers flowing through it, clean water, suitable for agriculture. Therefore, tons of civilizations, many, many civilizations have decided to settle in this area. Very cool. As I walk further past around the sort of edge of this park along this trail. Maybe a glimmer of hope. I saw some people inside the park. They were at like a little uh, covered area next to some sort of historical thing to see because there was like a little sign. They were in there reading it. And it was just three of them. They were not wearing matching clothes, which makes me think that they are letting sort of like just individuals into this park to see the ruins. <sighs> Just gotta figure out exactly how to get in. But I think there's a way. I think there's a way. We're gonna keep looking. All right, so we've walked, well, basically all the way around the park and I haven't seen an entrance, but I did meet a couple of people and they told me that actually you do have to enter it through the museum. Um, and then I asked him if he need a, if I need a guide or if I can just enter by myself and he said you could just enter by yourself or you could you could do a guide but I think it's possible to enter by myself. Now I think thinking back on it what happened with that security guard back at the museum 
was. And this, for the non-Spanish speakers, is a bit of an issue that I've been having in Spanish sometimes. And that is, when you ask a question in Spanish, you use the exact same words that you would use to make a statement. So when I say, necesito una guía para entrar las ruinas, I'm saying, I need a guide to enter the ruins. If I want to make it a question, do I need a guide to enter the ruins? You just sort of say it like it's a question. Necesita una guía para entrar las ruinas? And one of the problems I have is sometimes I guess I don't say it enough like a question and people think that I'm making a statement. And I think that's what happened. I'm pretty sure that the guy just thought that I was up saying like, hey, I need a guide to enter the ruins. And he was just saying, no I, no I, there's, there's no guides here. So I don't think he was telling me that I can't enter the ruins without a guide. I think he was just telling me there are no guides here to guide you through the ruins. So that's probably my fault. Anyway, here's a nice shot of the river. Rio Tomebamba. Before we go back up to the museum and try and figure out try and figure out how to get uh, back into the ruins. Let's go. Okay, so found the entrance to the park. Turns out we were standing right next to it. And we just went the wrong way, or we didn't see it, even though there was a giant map and at least two people had told us exactly how to get into the park. Nonetheless, we took a nice walk around the park, got to see the river, that was nice, spoke to a few nice people. So all in all, not that big a loss. Unfortunately, the sky is getting very cloudy and it is supposed to rain pretty soon. So. Let's get through the ruins and see them before we start getting pouring, pouring rain. Because when it has been raining the last few days, it has been raining extremely hard. And we will get soaked, like drenched, within a minute. Anyway, here are some ruins that are right outside the museum. I think these may have actually been the ones that we were able to see from the window. Very, very cool. I just felt a small rain droplet on my hand. Let's get moving. We're gonna get out to the park here. So the problem is I don't really have any rain gear. Uh, yeah. You know what? It really looks like it's gonna rain. And the park entrance is right there. And now that I know exactly how to get into the park, I think it's starting to rain. It's definitely starting to rain. I think I'm gonna come back. Come back later, maybe tomorrow morning, and we're gonna see the park. Because I don't wanna get rained on, one, I don't wanna get completely drenched. But also, like, because I don't have any rain gear, this camera can't get wet. And if we get, like, drenched in the pouring rain, this camera gets soaking wet, it may destroy it. And I don't wanna do that. So, to be continued. So after doing one of the stupidest things that I've done on my entire trip, I did one of the smartest things that I've done on the entire trip, which was decide not to walk into the ruins and film at that moment. Because literally like two or three minutes after the end of this video here, uh, it was pouring rain. And I mean pouring, pouring rain. Torrential downpour that lasted for a few hours. So. Uh, we managed to avoid that, but stay tuned in the next video We are gonna come back here and we are gonna film in the ruins So make sure you check in for that and otherwise I hope you enjoyed this video and we'll see you next time